Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly discussion series that's hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center in collaboration with U of M Detroit Center, Unique Voices in Films, and CMN TV. Uh, and before I introduce you to our guest today, I want to wish all our Muslim friends and the Muslim community uh, Eid Mubarak. And today, our guest is Lilwa Khazoum. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, Lilwa, which I told her, her name sounds like Hilwa, and it turns out that her aunts nickname her sometimes Lilwa Hilwa, which means beautiful Hilwa. Um, she's an Iraqi Israeli American singer, and uh, her career has involved being a musician, dancer, writer, educator, and much, much more. Um, one of the things that I found is interesting is uh, she's the singer, songwriter, and bass player for the band Iraqis in Pajamas, a name that's very unique in itself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and she uses her, uh, the arts uh, to blend ancient, sacred, and original music as a catalyst for deep healing and transformation. Um, so I'm really interested to learn more about that. Welcome, Lua. Thanks. Thank you. Happy to be here. So um, I'd like to first learn a little bit about your background. Um, so what was your experience sure. growing up in the United States with Iraqi Jewish roots? For me, it wasn't so much Iraqi Jewish roots. It was I was Iraqi. So I grew up in a very strong Iraqi Jewish home. Uh, we were religious, Orthodox. And everything about our lives was Iraqi. It was just um, such an interwoven part of the fabric of my being. And it's funny because I had a friend um, older than me who uh, is Iraqi on one side, Egyptian on another. And, and um, she grew up stateless in Japan. And, um, and she said to me, after we got to know each other, she said, you know, it's so crazy because you were born and raised in the United States, but you talk like you're a refugee, like you talk like you're an immigrant. Uh, so it was in everything we did. It was in the prayers, the songs, the stories, the consciousness. Uh, my consciousness was always um, on the Middle East and with a Middle Eastern perspective. So yeah, it just it was just a part of everything. So can you share what state, uh, what, where were you born? I was born in Washington, DC. I was and, born in the United States. And were your parents from Iraq? How far, what generation are you? My dad is from Iraq. Uh, the Jews were kicked out in 1950. So he fled with everybody else. Uh, and most of them went to Israel, which is where my dad went. But then he went to study in the United States and he met my mom there. And my mom is actually a Jew by choice. She's from Danish, Irish, Welsh background and grew up in a family that's Quaker, Irish, uh, Quaker uh, Catholic and Protestant. And uh, she didn't resonate. Like she, she tried different churches and things. She didn't really feel it resonated with her spiritually. She studied different religions and uh, she felt Judaism was home. And she was actually in the process of converting when she met my dad. Um, and what's also interesting, you know, there's so many different aspects about uh, your question. And one of the things that's interesting is, so my dad was busy kind of trying to fit into the European American Jewish community, uh, is, you know, both in Israel and the United States, there was uh, very little consciousness or celebration of the diversity of the Jewish people. It was very monolithic. Uh, it's called Ashkenazi. It's a uh, Jewish heritage from Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, so, you know, they were, they were kind of shamed for being who they were and where they were from, which is crazy because, you know, the patriarch and matriarch of the Jewish people come from, or, you know, from Mesopotamia. And so like when I was six, I had to explain to a rabbi, like he didn't understand how is it possible that there's Jews from Iraq. And I'm like, well, you do know that Abraham and Sarah came from the same land as my family, right? I mean, why am I educating you? I'm six years old, you know? Anyhow, I'm kind of jumping around, but um, so my dad was caught up in all that and, and had shame and was kind of trying to pass in the Ashkenazi community. And as the story goes, you know, every now and then he just, his mind would wander, like they'd be driving in a car and he'd start 
singing one of the shpachot, the ancient Iraqi Jewish uh, chants. And my mom would be like, oh, what is that? And he'd get all embarrassed. Oh, just something from the old country. She's like, it's beautiful. Would you please sing it to me? And so my mom pulled it out of him. My sister is six years older than I am. And when she was a child, my dad sang her French lullabies. And when I was a child, my dad sang me Judeo-Arabic and Hebrew lullabies from Iraq. So all of the shvachot, all of the chants, the sacred chants, prayers, um, was what I grew up with, uh, you know, as lullabies. And so, you know, again, it was just, it was part of the air that I breathed. And that, I guess, kind of uh, gets us into the second question that I was going to say is that, you know, because most of your work incorporates the Mesopotamian heritage. Um, and I was, you know, see, to see how has your ancestral history defined you as a musician and writer. And I also wanted to see, like, how was it incorporated into your life? And now you just kind of explained that. And then so through that type of connection, then you kind of started incorporating um, the history and the heritage into your arts. Yeah, and I think also there's something about me. I mean, you know, there's kind of like the who is your soul and then how were you raised and what environment were you in? And these are all different variables. And for me, just from a very young age, I had such a love and passion and devotion, um, you know, to my heritage. and. My mom told me that when I was three months old, she was driving somewhere, you know, I'm in like, what is it called? The bassinet, like the little baby seat in the back. And she said she almost had an accident because I started um, like not singing with words, but singing like the melodies of the shpachot and like bopping back and forth to the shpachot. And she looked in the rear view mirror and she couldn't believe it because I was only three months old. So from a very, very young age, it was something that I resonated with so deeply. And growing up, we um, sang for hours, Friday night and Saturday is the Jewish Sabbath. And for hours, we would sit and sing, you know, all of these songs in Hebrew or Judeo-Arabic. And, you know, sometimes my sister and I didn't want to, <laughs> you know, and we would do this thing where we would like manipulate my parents. We would sing the same chorus over and over and over and over. <laughs> Like we're not going to stop until, you know, and we'd have some demand. So we had some fun with that. But, you know, I'm really glad even even at the times that I was a child and I wanted to play, I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to be singing for four hours, you know, that that was the rule. That's what we did. And I'm really glad, you know, that I grew up with that. I remember one time I was uh, eight years old and the kids in the synagogue, we went to a synagogue that was a mishmash of Jews from anywhere not Ashkenazi, like not Central and Eastern European. So we had Jews from like, you know, India, Morocco, Iraq, you know, wherever. It was just all of us in one place. And uh, the kids always used to play in the back. And I was doing, you know, my normal running down the aisle to go play with the kids. And this hand reached out and <laughs> stopped me. And it was my dad and he sat me next to him and he made a decision for whatever reason, randomly on that day, from then on, I was gonna learn how to pray. And in the beginning I was kicking and screaming. I wanted to play with the other kids. But once I was taught the prayers, I loved them. And by the time I was eight, I could lead the prayers in the Iraqi tradition. And, you know, also in, in the Middle Eastern North African uh, Jewish community and in the United States also, people were trying to become Ashkenazi. So it was very, very unusual that somebody my age knew the prayers and I sang them in the pronunciation of the Iraqi Jews. So Hebrew originates in the Middle East. And yet when Jews ended up, there's all this history of, you know, exile and whatever. And when Jews, uh, the Jewish community that ended up in Central and Eastern Europe, they were speaking Slavic and Germanic languages. They couldn't make the distinct pronunciations of the original Hebrew. So they have what is called the double letters. They couldn't say ha, so they said ha. They couldn't say ah, so they said ah. I was singing at the age of eight, all of the original pronunciations. Now this flew in the face of how Hebrew was being taught, of how people were praying. And on top of that, I was a girl. So, you know, it was something that was very rare and I resonated it with it so deeply. And, and, you know, I loved when I had the opportunity to lead uh, the prayers or the rituals in my home. I just, I was like ecstatic. It was, you know, it was beautiful. So I've always had some very deep soul connection 
uh, to my roots, uh, to this tradition. And what's really funny is when I was a kid, I studied at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. I studied flute and piano, classical, you know, classical European concert music, right? And my mom was always trying to get me to incorporate the Iraqi prayers. And I'm like, mom, stop, you know? <laughs> You know what I mean? Just let me play this piano sonata. I said, why do we all do that? So much of what you're saying, I can relate to, like with our Aramaic and me resisting and studying French, for instance, when really I never, four years of French and I never used it. And then now I'm trying to really get into the Aramaic. And we, it's interesting that we all do that, where we resist um, learning some of the things that- Well, it wasn't that I resisted learning. I mean, I mean, I did learn like every Shabbat, every Sabbath, you know, I was very into learning everything, but it was, you know, my mom really wanted to see me kind of combine. She's like, oh, you know, take the Iraqi Jewish prayers and combine it with your piano. And I was like, leave me alone. I just want to play Bach. You know what I mean? So, but you know, it's what really funny. I mean, I- what was your, Did your mom have any uh, background in the arts or anything like that? You I know, my mom was- That kind of a suggestion. Yeah, my mom was a visionary. I mean, she didn't know she was a visionary, um, but she was always very creative and innovative and super, super bright. Um, you know, but she had severe ADD and when she was growing up in the Midwest, you know, they called her dumb because they didn't understand things like dyslexia and stuff like that. So she had like really bad self-esteem issues, but was always super creative, was always making things, you know, was always um, sewing or crocheting or doing some ceramics or, you know, there was always, always art. And I think she had a very artistic, brilliant mind, you know, it's just she didn't know it. She didn't kind of own it or claim it, but she just was it, which I think is also beautiful. You know, like you never know when you're growing up. I mean, what what part of the things that are just kind of around you, uh, you know, influence you? What is actually like who you are? You know, I think my mom and I on the soul level are very resonant. Um, you know, she's living in the next world now, you know, for two years, actually, as of just a few days ago, but, you know, um, she, uh, she, I, I do think, you know, she, she saw something, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't click with me the way that she was seeing it, but I laugh now because, you know, decades later, it ends up being a very significant thread of the music that I create, and the way that it happened was I was writing um, alternative and punk rock, just kind of straight up alternative and punk, Although people always told me from the very beginning that they heard Middle Eastern themes in it, I didn't hear it. But I think that's because to me, it's just so normal that maybe I don't even distinguish it because it has to be like really hardcore Middle Eastern for me to recognize it as being that's Middle Eastern, you know, but it just flows through me, right? Anyhow, I had this experience that really bothered me in, um, in a prayer community once and I came home and the way that I expressed my angst was I took one of the uh, religious songs for one of the holidays and I made a punk rock version of it. And I was like yelling these lyrics in English and then going back and forth between yelling your English lyrics and then singing a very sped up, you know, uh, you know, punk version of this, of this religious song. And once I did that, I was like, oh, it just, it felt good. And, and because for so many reasons we don't have to get into here, you know, I never felt like I belonged in different communities because I'm so many different things. I'm a part of so many different things, but not a part of because I'm all these other things too. And people, I think, you know, define things in very rigid ways. So I felt kind of lost and wandering. And when I created that song, I'm like, this is it. This is like my mobile synagogue. This is like, I can create the kind of Jewish world that I want, which incorporates this ancient heritage, has global consciousness, also has consciousness about things people weren't talking about or singing about, you know, like in the Jewish community, like domestic violence is, is common like it is in every other community. We don't talk about it. You know, so these are, I, I talk about these things very directly and whereas there may be no space for it yet in some established community, my band has become the place for that. And you do that not only through music, but you are also your writer um, and your work has been featured in top media, including the New York Times and Rolling Stone. Um, and you have uh, written a book uh, that was uh, two books, one that was published, um, the one that was 
consequence beyond resisting rape? What um, I'd like to learn more, you know, yeah, about that book, please. Yeah, sure. Um, as a girl and young woman, uh, harassment in various forms is constant. Some of it is more subtle and some of it is more aggressive and in your face. So, and it also depends, like, you know, if you're living in New York City, which I did for a time, it's just nonstop, hey baby, blah, 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 blah. And it felt so um, invasive and suffocating to me. And I found that uh, girls were kind of conditioned to see it as a compliment. Like if some guy is, you know, checking out your ass and yeah, you know, that that's seen as a compliment. And to me, it felt so disrespectful. And there's a distinction between, you know, if I'm walking down the street and this has happened also like very positive experience of a man saying, hey, you're really beautiful or hey, you have a gorgeous smile. I like that, right? But that's really different than being looked at like I'm a slab of meat. And it's like the man is not taking me as a human being into consideration. It's just, you know, like, like something serving him. And I found that we don't have even in so many ways language for describing that. Like it's not necessarily, and things have changed. Like we're living in a different world now. You have to remember, this is like yeah. the early 1990s when I was in my 20s. Right, that book I believe was published in 2002. Am I correct? It was actually 2000. It was, I wrote it in 97. Okay. And uh, well, I'll, I'll just kind of cut to the chase, which was I started hitting men who harassed me. And then I wrote about that experience. So the first half of the book, is all of these anecdotes of me having these encounters. And the second half of the book is a social analysis. Like, why is it that the incidents I was responding to were not seen as violent, but my response to them was? What does that mean about how we think about power and women and especially girls oh, so and young women? So you like physically? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and not even the feminist done. press, huh? What was their responses? Uh, all over the map. I'll get to that in a second. But but what I wanted to say is not even the feminist press would touch my book. Nobody would touch my book. I tried to publish it for like three years. Nobody wanted it. And finally, in 2000, I said, okay, I'll self publish. And that was unusual back then. That wasn't, you know, now it's just the norm. Right. But anyhow, uh, responses were, well, first of all, my response was I felt elated. I felt free. It was fun. It was like, how many girls and women have gotten like, we get mad, we're like, you know, but we feel powerless. And I was like, if you don't get out of my face, I'm going to hit you, right? So it's this thing of like taking up my space. And I'm a very loving, gentle, nurturing person. But it's like, if somebody is following me or sitting next to me and then, and then, and then, and I'm like, you know, I was sitting here peacefully by myself. I'd really appreciate it. You know, if you wouldn't be talking to me, you know, I, I'm kind of in a meditation and they just keep at it. Uh, nah, nah, nah. You know, why should I have to get up and leave? Why should I have to get up and leave? We are always handing over our space to men. And I said enough. So we responsible for the men's behavior towards us, depending exactly. on how we dressing or how we look. Exactly. You know, and it's, it's structured. I mean, as Middle Eastern women, you know, all the women in my family, you know, even though we're Jewish and it's not required in our tradition, you know, under Islam, you have to wear the hijab or the abaya or, you know, whatever it's called in different countries, you know, and even there, it's like women were getting, you know, groped or harassed or something. And it has nothing to do with what we're wearing or what we're saying or what we're doing. It's a power dynamic. It's an absolute power dynamic. And I just said enough, I'm not going to participate anymore. And so it started with, um, there were these guys who were staring at my chest and they wouldn't stop. And I confronted them and they just thought it was cute. You know, like, oh, look, she's like, you know, saying something to us, haha, ha, but she can't stop us. And I hit one of them in the crotch and he flipped out and he, he was like, what the hell? And then his friends started laughing and then I hit him in the crotch. And then I just start, like I was at a falafel stand and I just started knocking them around. And then this woman freaked out. She starts going, what is it? What's happening? What's going on? And the falafel guy was so funny, just calmly kept making the falafel. And at the end of this journey, like this, this went on for like a month, you know, that I was doing this. And at the end of the journey, I went back to the falafel stand and that guy goes, so you're not agitated today. And he said it kind of with a wink. And I said, well, there's no assholes in the store to bother me. And it shocked me. He goes, you're, he goes, you're right. They were behaving very badly. You know, and I was like, my God, this is like this older man. And he totally supported me. And it was the woman who was freaking out. And I keep finding that like women have 
been very stressed out by my book because we're so taught, oh, you have to be peaceful. You have to, well, peaceful includes me being able to have peace. And I think there's a difference between violence and physical combat or physical response. If, if I'm just doing my own thing, you know, and trying to just have a quiet day and someone's in my face nah, 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 and, it, and it's derogatory, it's hypersexualized, it's, you know, invasive. And I try, you know, one, two, three times to let them know this is not pleasant. This is feeling violent. This is feeling invasive. And they keep doing it. Well, yeah, I'm going to deck them. And guys get that. Guys are like, yeah, of course. Women are like, what? What? Oh, no. So Ooh, I can't I can't get this scene out of my head. I'm sorry. But right now, <laughs> I'm like, this would be a very good scene in one of like an Iraqi American movie or something like that. And <laughs> maker I can't get this scene out of my head but but I see what you're saying and I see the point that you're trying to make and I'm wondering how did that um th there's another book that you wrote or you edited this next book which yeah I, yeah and it's called the flying camel essays on identity by women of North African and Middle Eastern Jewish heritage which obviously this is of a different nature and has again goes back to um your heritage and what was the experience of being involved in this book? And what is th what are the things that we can learn from this book, from reading it? Well, the reason I compiled it, I actually started it when I was 22 years old. So it was in the early 90s, like 1992, maybe 1993, I can't remember, but uh, 23 years old. Anyhow, somewhere around then. And the reason was that I started in uh, college to formally be a Jewish multicultural educator. So my whole life as a child, I felt really angry about the Ashkenazi domination of everything Jewish. It's like we didn't even exist. And there was so much derogatory, discriminatory treatment um, that was just kind of accepted. And I knew from a very young age, I was gonna do something. I didn't know what it was. And in college, I started a group called Student Organization of Jews from Iran and Arab countries. Actually, the Iran part wasn't the original name that came on later. But anyhow, the point is that I, I ended up on this path as a Jewish multicultural educator. And I found that because nobody was doing anything like that at the time, whether the work was going to be done or not depended on whether a synagogue or community organization liked me and how they felt towards me or in their interactions with me. So I felt this kind of public responsibility. And as part of that, <clears throat> I felt I couldn't tell my story. I couldn't express any anger. I couldn't kind of like call out some of the really difficult dynamics to talk about like Jew on Jew racism. I couldn't talk about that because if I did, that would sacrifice being able to do the deeper work of educating people. And my approach in educating people was you have been cheated of a rich Jewish education. You are actually part of a 4,000 year old tapestry of incredible beauty in music and intelligentsia and you know culture and all these different things from around the world. Why haven't you learned about it? And you know, I kind of got them to think about it in a way of it's something that they wanted. It was something valuable. And then to think with me, why haven't you gotten that? And what can we together do about it? So me coming in and saying, ah, racism and, you know, you guys are assholes or that wouldn't really work, but I needed an outlet for talking about my experience and for calling things out really directly, like for talking about the pain that I experienced growing up. So I tried writing articles about it, but nobody wanted to publish the articles. And it was for all of these complex reasons. So like the feminist world didn't recognize us, you know, the Jewish world, it's like, well, we're irrelevant because we're Middle Eastern, you know, and it was kind of like, and then the Middle Eastern world where you're both Jewish and you're female, you know, so anywhere I went, it was like being uh, in a pinball machine and you kept getting bounced around and nobody really cared. So I thought, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to put together a book talking about this experience. And there's two things that I, I want to share about that. Number one is that at that time, the only Middle Eastern Jewish feminist I knew was my sister and myself. So I embarked on this project and I didn't even know, do I have the right to put together this book, which was basically talking about, you know, this kind of three point identity. We're Middle Eastern, we're Jewish and we're women. And then what is that like? 
And, you know, the, the women that I knew in the community uh, were very, um, you know, very submissive. Like you sit in the back of the synagogue behind a wall. Nobody questions that. I was, I was like leading a synagogue revolution when I was 14, you know, going up and down the aisle and getting the women to out sing the men and then going up and confronting the rabbi and walking in the men's section, which you're not allowed to do. You know, I've always been like, <laughs> like this, you know, catalyst for change, right? So it ended up being this whole journey of, finding where do i find other women who are like me and that took years to gather the stories um and then you know a lot of the women aren't writers so they have these amazing stories but their their writing was really like kind of jangly and and so then there was this whole process of honestly i'm never going to do an anthology again because the amount of writing that i did was so much more than just writing my own book because i had to you know i wanted to preserve the integrity of the voice of each woman but I also had to write it coherently and then make it fit with the writing of all of the other essays. Um, and then once I put this whole book together and it was ready to go, nobody wanted to publish it. And for years I was trying to publish it. Everyone rejected us, the, the women's press, the Jewish press, the Middle Eastern press, for all of the reasons that we had talked about in the book, that was all playing out. And then 9-11 happened. And then seven top literary agents were fighting over the book and then I published it. But it was like 13 years or, or 12 or something years after I had started. And honestly, if it wasn't an anthology, if it was just my book, I would have given up long ago, but I promised these women. And because I promised these women, I kept going. Well, good for you. And you know, I don't think you don't even have to be of the backgrounds and that you just described because I think there's other women in different communities where they feel they are unheard because they don't fall into certain minority categories. And so you're, you're Middle Easterner, you're a woman, but you're Jewish. Uh, same, you know, I'm Middle Easterner woman, but I'm Chaldean. And so it's like, there'll be that other identity that will prevent you from really being heard by the mainstream media. But yeah, in your case, you continue anyways, which is really, that's a beautiful thing. And I want to have a chance because I saw this on um, your website and your YouTube channels. Uh, like you were reading, what is this called? I was, um, it's an Iraqi, Habdallah. Is that, am I saying yeah. that? Right? Yeah, Habdallah. Yeah, and I saw like people holding candles and things like that. I mean, we're not going to have, you know, are you able to kind of just share a, a few minutes of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can jump into the ritual. Okay. So that's like the ritual. Uh, that we say that that's the prayer that we say before doing the whole ritual of ending the Sabbath. It's a part of it. <laughs> it goes on. Oh, your volume has disappeared. Hello. There, oh, I am. there you are. Uh, I was I, I had I pinned you because I wanted uh, oh. yeah, extra focus on you as you were um, sharing that that was very, very beautiful. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, just uh, we only have like only literally like two minutes left, and I just want to ask for your. I've I've seen an article that you written that you one time shared on Facebook about some of the things that we need to confront that has happened, you know, in the Middle East for us to be able to move forward. Just a few last words about that. Why is it so important for us to recognize some of the things that we have inflicted? on ourselves. And I think this goes for every single region and every single culture and background. Uh, but, you know, with regards to the Middle East, why is that important for, for them to be able to heal and, and what maybe like a step or two that they need to take in order for to make that happen and create some of that unity that we used to have from different backgrounds and different religions living together? That's a great question. You know, I see it very much parallel to what goes on in families in domestic violence situations. There's so much trauma and upheaval in the Middle East. And in families that have domestic violence, you know, we talk about it in black and white, but it's not. It's very complex. It's these people who you love, you know, these people who are the most important people to you in the world are also the people hurting you. So, you know, we have this shared identity, but we're like down each other's throats and there's all these divisions. And it's kind of like what you said before, I'd like to pick up on, 
is that those of us who actually have these quote unquote surprising identities, I think we're the linchpin because we um, we disrupt people's ideas that enable them to go black and white. There is no black and white. We are all human beings. And these, these barriers, these divisions, they're false. And these are human constructs. And I think, you know, no matter what God we believe in, that the root of all religion is love and is being a good person and a kind person. I mean, nobody's attracted to a religion because it's full of hate or because, you know, it's running around being violent. I mean, that's things that people do with religion. And so I think, you know, if we can see these points of connection, and I think women like you and me and other people who have these, you know, identities people don't expect are the ones who we are an example that these barriers are false because you know what I cross all of them. You know, it's like I've had Muslim boyfriends, Arab boyfriends and people in the Jewish community were always surprised. I said, you know what, I have more culturally in common with this person than I do with an Ashkenazi man. And in some ways it's harder for me with an Ashkenazi man. And they were shocked, you know, but there are these different aspects of me. And I think that the more that we can open to hearing people who stand on these you know, points of intersection, the more that everybody, I think, will be able to open to how do we see ourselves in the other person because there is no other. Lelua, that was so beautiful. I really love uh, what you're about and I love Thank your you. openness and your honesty. Thank you. It's it's important for all of us to have that. It, it um, really builds, helps, like, it gives character. It gives so much character and a lot of us are hiding behind masks in order to fit into the identities that are given to us sometimes by others or that we were born with. Um, and our heritage is very important and very beautiful and we find creative ways to share it. But it's really, it's being honest about who we are as humans first. That's very important. And I think like you, you exemplify that. Thank so, you. That yes. means so much to me. Thank it's you. It's really true. I've had so much fun interviewing you for that reason. Sometimes, you know, those are the moments for me that I get to learn so much and I get inspired by people, especially women who are that honest and upfront and just so lovable like that. So thank you. God thank bless. You. I wish thank you me. the best of luck with all of your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.